So if you are working on a 2D game with frame-based animations, and your animator tab looks like this, this, or this, well, you are very likely in the chaotic realm of animator hell. So please, follow me back into the light, back to a place of order. So in my past devlogs and tutorials, I've often showed glimpses of my animator tab with nicely laid out animation nodes, with no transition links or spiderweb-like structure. A lot of people reached out to me for information as to how I managed to do this. So let me explain. So this here is the Unity Animator tab. I'm sure you know it. The nodes represent the different animations attached to a particular game object. Almost every tutorial I've seen for making simple frame-based animation changes, with even pixel art for instance, is pushing beginners into this complex network of nodes linked together through these animation transitions. Each transition line when selected will have on it a number of different settings, many of which are not even applicable to frame-based animation, things like animation blending. This network is then tied to a list of animator-specific parameters where instead of just specifying what animation should be played, you are required to set a bunch of animator specific conditions. Things like is grounded or player speed or things like that. This whole system is sometimes referred to as the Unity Mechanism. Well, you see, in a simple tutorial, when you only have like three animation states, like a jump, run or an attack, then sure, this approach might be manageable, laying things out in this pretty little triangle structure that you often see. But try to do this with more than 10 animations, or in my case, uh, 48. If you have tried this approach, then you might have played the fun little game of trying to find an orderly and aesthetically pleasing structure to your layout. It's a lot of fun. Not really. And throughout the internet, there is no shortage of developers voicing their anguish as they fight against this system. I mean, look at this poor soul here. And the same goes for things like blend trees. They are not the optimal solution for frame-based animation. I mean, the name itself is very telling of that, blend trees, which is inherently designed for blending skeletal animations between different states. But if you are working on 2D frame-based animations, this topological animator approach very quickly leads to animations twitching, flickering, overriding each other, or straight up not playing as situations can easily emerge where multiple animations fight for priority and essentially just get locked. For a code-oriented programmer like myself, it's just clumsy to work with. I myself lost weeks of time wrestling with this system until I was eventually like, what the hell am I doing here? And realized this is not the right approach for me or my game. You see, when making frame-based 2D games, you don't need any of this. Beginners often don't realize you can just tell the animator directly what animation it should play, then manage the animation states with custom code much more efficiently and easily. And if something doesn't work, it's a lot easier to see what went wrong. You need a reference to the animator component, but this time, instead of using animator conventions like set float, set ball, and to manage our animations, we are going to use the animator.play functionality, where we can pass in the name of our animation as a string. You see, when you use that first approach with that set ball, set float, you are offloading the logic to another system. A black box essentially. And all this is often getting wrapped up into yet another layer of custom conditional code anyway, creating layers upon layers of conditional wrapping, like a stinky onion. It's much simpler to manage all the conditional logic in one place with a custom code approach. So how do we use this approach to manage multiple animations? We simply need a reference to the animator, a string called current state, and a change animation state function, which will take a single argument of new state of type string. So within this new function, we can start by telling the animator to play the new state. We will also write what is known as a guard. This will stop the same animation trying to play that is already playing essentially. Then finally, we will reassign the current animation state to the new state. This change animation state function is at the core of how we are going to be managing our animation states. All right, so let's now take a look at a practical real world example of this using an actual player controller. So I've got this 
little sample scene here I've mocked up. I'm just going to run it to show you guys what's going on. So we've got Mega Man. He's moving around, he's jumping, but he's not animating. And if we go up into the animator window for the player, you can see here I've got a series of animations nicely laid out to represent the different animations that Mega Man might have. We've got idle, run, jump, player attack, and player air attack. And I'm going to give this project for you guys down below so you can grab it, you can follow along with me, and you can work out how we integrate these animations. So this isn't one of those tutorials where you have to follow along with the code writing it yourself. You can kind of sit back and watch it as more of a lecture format. But if you wanted to challenge yourself and actually write the code with me, then you're more than welcome to follow along with the supplied files I've linked below. So let's take a look at the script file. Let's find Mega Man. Let's pop this open. So this is a script that I'll make available for you guys. And I'll just quickly, very quickly run you through it. I don't want to make this into like a player controller tutorial video because it's just going to get too long. I want this to be very specific to the animation methodology that I'm trying to um, convey here. Okay, so we've got the animator, very importantly. We've got a bunch of um, stuff here just for kind of moving around and ground checks and jump force and things like that. Um, a lot of input stuff. So here, okay, so I've made a bunch of constants to represent the animations in the game. Um, so if we go to the animated tab, see the names here, idle, run, jump, attack, all that, they are just here as constants. This saves us writing out each name over and over, and it saves us having typos and things like that. And you can most certainly put these into like an enum. I know a lot of people like to do that. Enums are ways that you can hold different parameters into in like one encapsulated object. Um, but because it's a very beginner friendly tutorial, I don't want to get too much into enums right now. Okay. So it's got a um, rigid body, we mapping an animator, we've got a ground mask that we're using for a ground check. And in the update loop, very lightweight, we're just checking the left axes, so left and right buttons on the joystick and A and D on the keyboard. Um, we have a, um, a spacebar check, we have a right control keyboard check, which is flagging the attack. And down in the fixed update, as you guys know, update is for like input checks. Fixed update is for actually executing um, physics and movement and things like that. In the fixed update, we are just checking for the ground and we are using um, is grounded. We are flagging that to true or false, depending on if it can find the ground beneath the player. And then we are just creating a velocity holder and we are checking if that X axis that we mapped in the update is either is pressed left, middle or right. And then we have is jumped. We're adding the force to the jump and then we're mapping the velocity. And okay, so here we are checking if the attack is pressed. We have a check to make sure that is attacking is false before it's true. And we're doing that because we don't, when we do eventually write this animation code in here, we don't want the attack to be overriding itself. So let's look at adding these animation play references. Okay, so if we are pressing left, if we are pressing right, then move the player. And if we're not, then velocity is zero. So here would be a good place to start for the idle. We will say change animation state. Player, oh, instead our constants are here. Player idle, nice and convenient. And if left or right is being pressed, then player run. And you can put them here like that. But we don't like to repeat ourselves in code. So what we might do, we're going to say if um, x axis is not equal to zero, which means it's being pressed either left or right, then um, change animation state to run. And what we can do, we can just maybe we we'll just put make an else and move the idle here. That's a little bit neater. You'll notice that I'm putting this change animation state logic within the player script. You don't have to put it there. I'm doing it just for convenience for this video. If you wanted to, you could make like an, a separate script called Animation Manager or something like that. Then you could talk between the player script and the Animation Manager and tell it what to do. But I don't want to be jumping between too many tabs and windows right now so people don't get confused. But yeah, you can do it like that if you wanted to. All right, so if I was to quickly run that as a test. Cool, and he blinks, boom. All right, so that's working fine. Oh, and by the way, you might be aware that right now there is a huge sale going on on the Unity Asset Store. 
and one of my own assets, the Ultimate 2D Car Game Kit, is part of that sale. So if you've ever been interested in making car games, this is a great foundation to get into that genre. It's got like full mobile support, full controller support, ready to build um, sound effects, drift physics, race systems, everything you can think of. It's really cool. So do check it out. It's a fantastic asset that I personally built with a lot of attention and care for you guys to make games with and hopefully make money with too through the App Store or Steam. So now we just need to do the jump. So here we are checking for the jump press. We're adding uh, force. So we just say change. Oh, change animation state to player jump. Okay, and that will let the player jump. But what we need to do, we want to make sure that the idle is not overriding the jump. So we need to write um, a condition over here for that. And I'll explain to you just why very quickly. I'll run that to show you what the problem will be. So jump, oh, yep, you see that? He tries to jump. You can see his arms raise and the idle takes over. So what we'll do, we can wrap this whole thing here. We'll say if is grounded, and I'll just move this closing bracket over here. So only if they're on the ground and then if the joystick is moving or not will it respond to those animations. Otherwise it's just going to jump. Oh, look at that. I'm digging that. So at this point we've got three animations without any uh, fancy spiderweb networks or any parameters being sent to the animator or you know, set float, set bull. So we'll wrap this up with the um, attack. All right, so in this condi condition block here, so if the input is being pressed to attack, then we want to um, change animation state to player attack. And you see, we have two attacks with air attack and a normal attack. So we now we need to choose between which of those we want to do. And we'll do that by simply checking if we're on the ground or not. So say if is grounded. So if uh, is grounded is true, then play the normal ground attack. Else, I'll just copy and paste this. And we're going to say player air attack. Cool, that makes sense, right? So if we're on the ground, play the normal attack. If we're not on the ground, play the air attack. So you can see here we have this attack complete that I've just set up. And it's, all it's doing is um, setting attack back to false. And what that means is because we have this condition here that doesn't actually allow the attack to play more than once until this um, Boolean flag is set back to false. So attack will only play if attacking is not already attacking, basically. Um, then after a period of time, we want to um, call this attack complete. So to do that, for the purpose of just this tutorial, I'm going to use an invoke. And all this does is it calls another function after a period of time. So all you do is pass in the string name, which in this case is uh, attack complete. And then you need to pass in a time. After how long should this um, function be called? And as I mentioned, you can just kind of hard code in the value like um, 0.3, but I've actually created a uh, attack delay variable at the top here, which I've set to 0.3. And I've serialized that, so you can kind of play with it through the inspector to kind of get the best outcome you want. Um, but we'll just go back down to there. Right, so what this is gonna do is, this is just gonna, after 0.3 of a second, it's gonna allow us to shoot again. So I might just, um, so we just want to also make sure that um, before the play goes back to an idle state, he's also not shooting, much like we did with the grounded. Is attacking. So if it's grounded and is attacking, is false. So we don't want the play to be attacking uh, when we make the decision to go back to idle or to run. So one problem I have here is um, I didn't include the Mega Man run shoot animation. If you've ever played Mega Man, you'll know that he can run and shoot at the same time. I don't have that. So he's kind of gonna go back to an idle, but 
the point will be made anyway, I think. Um, all right, so what if you wanted to map this attack delay to the length of one of these specific animations? Depending on the kind of game you're making, if you're making like a fighting game that has like broad sweeping attacks like a sword, then typically you might want to wait for that animation to completely finish playing before then you um, tell it it can do something else. Well, what you can do is you can say um, attack delay equals animator dot get current animator state info and then open and close brackets and put in passing a zero and that's an index value so that's returning the current animation that's playing the animator's current animation and then we just simply ask for the length so this attack now delay will return in seconds as a float um, how long either of these um, animations are which is really cool because if the attack ground animation and the air animation are different, if one was longer than the other, then you could wait till they have completely finished to do it like that. But in this case, we'll just leave it um, as this attack value, which is like 0 0.3, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, well, that should be it. So let's, let's check this out now, see what happens. Pretty excited, actually. So we got the running, got the jumping, and now we got the pew, 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 and now jump shoot, jump shoot. I know there's no bullets, guys. I know, I know. But if you want to learn how to do like bullets and stuff like that, I have many tutorials that I've already covered this topic in detail. So um, I'll put links or thumbnails or something for you guys to reference. But um, yeah, for the time being, we just have the animation state. But look at that, guys. We've got the, we've got the jump. And like I mentioned, I don't have the run shoot. So that's why he's kind of sliding and shooting. Um, but we've got the jump, we've got the shoot, and it's really cool, guys. So the most important thing here is that this animator is super clean, no crazy links, no spider webs, and, and this parameter list is empty, no conditions, no, no shenanigans, no malarkey. Everything is clean and optimal and easy to follow. I use these exact same techniques to approach the animation management in my own game, Blood and Mead, where I have dozens upon dozens of different situational animations with different condition checks and things like that. And it works beautifully. You can actually wishlist the game on Steam at the moment. So if you did that, that'll be really cool. Yeah. So what I'll do, I'll actually make this whole complete project available for all you guys to play with down below. So get into it, guys, and make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you found it useful. Oh, and by the way, you can see here the new setup is kind of semi-active. I'm still working on a few little kinks and there's this wires running everywhere at this point. So that's it. All the best on your game dev adventures and I hope to see you all in the next video. Bye. And a huge thank you to all my Patreon family here. I absolutely love you guys. Thank you for your support.